one of the team of eight um, taking part in a shared learning project in the Thames Discovery Programme and U3A. We were tasked to help with the research of the Thames Shipbuilding Company's archives in London to produce reports of our findings and increase understanding of the Thames shipbuilding industry during this period. This is us at our project launch in Deptford. You recognise anybody? You recognise anybody? There's Elliot. There's We're George. in the pub. We're in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> you may recognise the surroundings rather than the people. Um, right. Right, OK. These are the shipyards we looked at. As you can see, there's an, an assortment of wood and iron. What we found out about the shipbuilders in general was they were wealthy landowners, they were merchants, they were dealing with all manner of businesses, others were MPs directly involved with the development and extensions of yards along the Thames. There were plenty of interesting family dynamics, marriages linking companies together and many rifts between them and some shady dealings along the way. Some were engineers, many from the north, particularly Scotland, who, being skilled in the production of iron products such as boilers and engines, saw a way to become shipbuilders themselves. In London, they were able to make the contracts and attract the finance. I've got a few images now for you to look at. This is basically just looking at the maps and the locations and the size of the dockyards around this period. Yeah. Okay. We've also got a nice picture, which I actually love, is what a Victorian shipyard looked like, and also a building the Great Eastern. Okay, the Samuda Brothers. We thought Greenland Dock because of the Brents. We're going to cover the Brents in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, and the Samuda Brothers were an iron shipyard. A flavour of what was happening at the Buddhist um, Iron Shipyards and what we've discovered so far. Um, Samuel and Daniel Brent had inherited their father's share of the shipbuilding business. Orders for new ships were on the decline. The East India Company had already being built more cost effectively in India, and the new naval, new naval dockyards all having an impact. The shipyard was struggling. The workforce of 483 men in 1811 was reduced to 134 by 1813. To survive, they turned to innovation and technology. Samuel died in 1814, leaving his share of the business for his two sons. The, young, the youngest, also called Samuel, went into partnership with his uncle. Samuel Jr. was a great fan of the new steam technology. He actually went on to apply for employment as an engineer on a New York steamer, packet steamer. They designed and built three steam-powered paddle packet ships, including the London Engineer in 1818. The Rising Star was built by them and was one of the first warships. Around 1819, both Samuel Jr. and his brother located or liquidated their shares in the shipyard and Daniel continued on alone, launching the Criteria in 1826. After struggling financially for many years, he finally went out of business in 1828. John Dugman was another of our shipbuilders, um, and he was also a wood shipbuilder. In contrast, he decided his workforce reduced from 340 in 1810 to 21 in 1813. He chose not to embrace the new technology and sold his yard the same year to Charles Gordon. <coughs> J.W. Dudgeon were John and William. They were shipbuilders of Millwall. They were originally blacksmiths in Scotland and they had gained experience with some of the leading engineering firms. In 1859, they founded an engineering shop in Millwall and in 1861 started shipbuilding at Cubitt Town. One of the first vessels was the Thunder that reached a speed of 14 knots. 1861 introduced propulsion by ind independently driven twin screws. The Dudgeons were the first to build any number of twin screw vessels and to demonstrate their worth. Attempts to build a larger ship ended badly and William, when William Dudgeon died in 1875, the yard closed. Ditchburn and Mare were founded in 1835. In 1838, the Daylight was one of the first iron vessels to be built on the Thames and it was built by them. 
in 1846 and joined with William Fairburn and Sons, Ditchburn and Mayer were contracted to build the greater part of the tubes that turned the bridge. The Fairburns weren't comfortable with the contract and Ditchburn and Mayer took over the entire work. Ditchburn retired and Mayer extended the works to the west side of Bow Creek as C.J. Mayer and Company, which included laying down a plant for making his own iron. By 1856, the works employed three to 4,000 men, but became insolvent the same year. After taking a contract for a low, low price to supply gunboats, the firm was taken over by his father-in-law, Peter Rolt, in 1857, and reformed as the Thames Ironworks and Shipbuilding Company. The following year, C.J. Mayer also formed a new business, the Millwall Iron and Shipbuilding Company. Our conclusions so far were that advances in technology drove the, cell, drove the change from self to steam. Why did shipbuilding move from the south bank to the north bank? The iron banks was already established on the north bank. Yards and walls were available. Engineering companies first developed and built increasingly efficient marine engines, progressing to building ships. The skills required for iron shipbuilding were very different to those of traditional trades of shipwrights and sailmakers and those involved in building wooden ships. What we did find surprising was both the wood and iron um, shipyards were affected by many of the same problems. Bankruptcies, long cost legal battles, poor investments, partnerships, problems with average contacts, contracts, labour costs and shipbuilding on the Thames. The different workforces were strongly unionised and unwilling to work together. High costs of transporting coal, iron and steel. Competition from shipyards in the north of the country and also from abroad. Uncertainty of orders for both merchant vessels and more ships according to economic conditions of the country and fluctuating demand from the Admiralty. The 1850s had been a boom time for the Isle of Dogs. However, a financial crash in 1866 involved an overend in Gurney decimated shipbuilding in London, causing distress to thousands of workers. The well-diversified businesses were most successful. They undertook work in bridge building, boiler making, iron roof manufacture, as well as inventing refining machines to bend iron for ships' hulls. The yards were used for warehousing, some shipbuilders turned to ships' husbands, and some others became shipbreakers. Very few companies actually made the transition. Wigram, Rolls and Green, by forming different partnerships as Wigram and Sons and RH and Green, successfully made the transition from sail to steam. They already held yards north of the Thames. Six and Mayor originally set up at Deptford in 1837, but after a five-day yard, they also moved to the North Bank a year later in 1838. We decided after looking at all this, everything we picked up and looked at, we thought, oh, that's it, that's the answer, and then we found something else on another road to go down, so we decided, you know, there was definitely more questions than answers when it came to this. Um, and some of those we kind of highlighted as areas for research, maybe. A profile of philanthropy, prominent families. There was a lot, especially on the wood ship builders. Um, we seem to be seeing lots of kind of intermarriage kind of things and partnerships going on. And with tenders and contracts, one of the things that came across was the fact that there were delays on payments from the Admiralty, which possibly could have affected them being in business or not. Scottish migration to the Thames area. There was a lot of Scottish people coming to the area at that time. And also the River Police. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>